Hello, Ken Revisa here. It's great to be with you. Hey, today what I'm excited about is I'm going to share three people who've really impacted my thinking and I've collaborated with over the last 20 years. First is Dave Snow. We go back to my days at Cal State Fullerton and then when Dave went to Loyola Marymount University and on to Long Beach State with the Dirtbags, working with his team. Next guest is going to be Steve Rousey, a player I had at Cal State Fullerton on the pitching staff and then went on to coach up at uh, Cal State Northridge where he was the head coach there for a good number of years and then pitching coach at Fresno State and then now Steve's made the full circle back to Cal State Fullerton as the pitching coach. And the final guest will be John Savage, UCLA coach and John and I worked together the last eight years and it's going to be great to share some of the insights I've gained from them and the way that we've collaborated together in pursuing the mental game. So look forward to sharing this with you. Okay, Ken Rubisi here and I got Dave Snow, a uh, good friend, coach in Long Beach State for years, Loyola Marymount. We go back to Cal State Fullerton days. John Savage at UCLA is with us as well and two guys here that have really helped me keep refining and developing my mental game. Dave being one of my early mentors and John one of my recent mentors that keeps me on my toes, no questions about that. And what I wanted to share today was uh, just something. Dave and I, when he retired from coaching at Long Beach State, we were doing some things together. And one thing we were invited to do was at the National College Softball Coaches Meeting. And we were gonna do a general session for all the coaches. And I had Dave write down uh, some of the key points he wanted to share. And later on, uh, about four years ago, I came across the old notes and I gave them to John. I said, hey, look at these points, they're pretty good. So I just thought we could just have a little dialogue here on some of these things. And one of the things, Dave, that you said to the coaches that day was, as a coach, you're already doing the mental game. You're already doing it as a coach. Could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, put it in simple terms. <clears throat> uh, as a coach, uh, your words and your actions and everything that you put forth to your team and those individuals, uh, they're going to process those thoughts. And you're going to impact their thinking and how they go about their work. And so every coach is coaching the mental game in some way, shape, or form, whether you realize it or not. Hmm. John, anything from your perspective on that? Well, I just agree with that. Just the more and more uh, you're around your players and the message that you're delivering them, uh, the impact that you have. Uh, body language, uh, verbal, uh, emotional, you know, during the game, during practice, uh, and a lot of times it's gonna it's gonna trend to the player and um, like like Dave said we've always been coaching the mental game it's just it's just, it's a lot more um, I guess you would say organized in a lot of ways and it uh, has a major power effect on the players and how they act and respond and think on a daily basis uh, more than sometimes we realize as coaches mm. okay. Second thing, Dave, you brought up was that it helps you develop skills and a vocabulary that helps you put the athlete in the moment. Yeah, yeah. I think as, as, as we started our work together, the thing I realized was that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm realizing I'm working the mental game, but now I can really hone in on that and take it to another level, okay? So that the communication between myself and the player, okay, uh, goes to another level, all right? And the vocabulary part of it was, uh, just came as a result of, of implementing the mental game, coming up with some catch words, some phrases, so that I can reach out to a player in any given moment, hey, check in, okay? You know that that means, hey, are you present? Mm -hmm. Are you in mm -hmm. the moment, Yeah. okay? Yeah. I'm just checking in, okay? Yeah. Or it might be let it go. Hey, let it go. 
you know, something negative happens, boom, trigger word, let it go, let mm -hmm. it go, all right? And of course, as you know, we work on having something to go to that works for you, that works for you, that has meaning. Right, yeah. John, again, it just, it's just consistent messages that you're delivering on a daily basis that are, um, players are, it's a, it's a routine game and it's a, it's a day to day, uh, every day game. And, uh, the more you can send consistent messages, having buzzwords, uh, or phrases or catchphrases that they know what those exactly mean. Uh, it's just the, the corporate knowledge of your team is just going to be much more, uh, on the same page. Another one, Dave, was where you said dealing with adversity through awareness gave us a competitive edge. Yeah, yeah. In other words, take it on an attitude that, uh, uh, hey, we know we're going to face adversity, okay? Uh, let's talk about it. Let's deal with it. And let's get to a point from a, uh, that, that we can say, bring it on. Bring it on. We know it's coming. It's not always going to be a, 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 an easy road. Mm. There's going to be bumps and bruises along the way. <laughs> Bring it on because by working the mental game and having the right thought process and mindset, I'll have a competitive edge over my opponent. Hmm. And that's a huge thing. Okay. Good. Just like you said, dealing with the game, uh, you know, having experience, knowing what, how difficult the game is at times. Uh, being prepared for that, you know, it's like a pitcher who's, you know, prehabbing, let's say, you know, he's preventing injury, you know, preventing, uh, you know, from being sore. It's, 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 a, it's, it's the same analogy just in terms of knowing that there's going to be adversity, knowing that there's going to be base runners, knowing that there is going to be a tight zone on fire or, or uh, bad hops or flares mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, that's going to come your way in terms of dealing with that now and, and expecting it and knowing, uh, you know, uh, have something to go to. And not panicking when that happens, but understanding that that's part of it. Yeah, and that's realizing that if you have the right mindset, and the right thinking going on, okay, you're going to respond proper to that adversity. You're going to be able to respond to it. Mm. And it's awareness also of like what is being done to you, you know, as a hitter. Uh, what, what type of approach does that team as a pitcher, you know, those awareness things is, is you know, can, can make you adapt uh, during a game, during a bat. Uh, you know, what is being done to me? I think that's a big deal today. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they don't have that awareness that this, you know, implements that, that approach. All right. You said something, Dave. Um, the more we worked on the process, the more we got off the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's all again, tying back, going back to, can we, can we put, put in a system that puts a player in position to be present, be in the moment, okay? And so uh, that, that's kind of where I, I am with that one. Yeah, okay. That's, you know, a very tough one. <laughs> because we're all result conscious. Um, they've been trained to be result conscious and now we're trying to kind of U-turn it and mm -hmm. get into the process. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, we all deal with that one, not only players, but coaches, because you know, you win or you lose. And not mm -hmm. only players and coaches, but sports psych consultants that go in and work with mm -hmm. teams, man. Yeah. You're bringing me in for a reason. Yeah. Just yeah. to get some damn yeah. results. Yeah. It's a, it's and the difference between an attitude of, hey, I got to get out of this inning. No, you got to get this pitch over the plate. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big difference. Big difference. Right? There's a big yes. difference. So again, we want results. And we're trying to get, get a competitive edge to, to get that result. And the competitive edge comes from stop trying to get out of the inning and put your energy on what you've got control of, which is executing this pitch. Definitely. And it's a long game. You got to keep pitching. You got to keep playing. I mean, it's a long game. And sometimes they forget that a little bit, you know, to where, you know, 
you you can find yourself not being a very good team for eight innings and, and have a good ninth and win the game. I mean, it's it's a funny game in that regard if you you know stay within right you know within within reason in the first eight innings. But uh, it, it's 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 about that pitch, like like Coach Snow said, and it's about you know that that process, which is really tough to do when you're talking about you know the the the, the youth of the player. And the thing here is, I've been with both of you numerous, many times when we're going through a regional, a super regional, Omaha. I mean, you're talking about a grind. You're talking about keeping that going through all of those games. And then sometimes you lose that Saturday game, you're coming back in 45 minutes and playing another game. And you've got to let that go and you've got to get back to what are we doing right here? And that's, that's part of what we deal with, no question. Matt, what do you think? I think it's great. Yeah, okay. All yeah, right. Um, mm -hmm. Let's get a pause so Matt can delete that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, another one I got for you is implementing and reinforcing and validating mental toughness develops the opportunity to develop performance in more ways than just getting results. Okay. Basically, you know, as, as this whole thing's kind of evolved, has evolved for, for us um, in trying to implement this mental game. We know we've got to reinforce it, okay? And we, we need to validate it so that when we see a player turning a bat around, for example, maybe he went up there and swung at a pitch he, he should never have been swinging at. And he knows it. And you see him frustrated, but he gets out of the box and gathers himself, gets a good breath, and gets back in the box and stings the ball. You need to validate, I need to validate that as a coach to that guy, because I just saw you turn that whole bat around. Mm. Okay? So there's more ways to. Uh, gain positives out of your performance than just the end result. Did he get a hit? No, he lined out to the shortstop. But he won the mental game because he regrouped and let, let it go. He regrouped, took possession, got a pitch, hit the ball hard. Mm. That's huge. That's huge. So if that kind of stuff is going on all the time, it allows you to have more ways to communicate with your players and more positive things you can talk about to them. Right. Because right? that hitter, if it's a 300 hitters, he's making seven outs out of 10. Right. But a lot of those seven outs, there could be some good stuff going on right. in those at-bats. And the term we use for that is, that I've always asked you guys, is how do the boys work it? Yeah. You know, how are they working the process? I mean, because I can, I can get the score find out you lost 3-1. That's not the issue, or you won 3-1. But how did the boys work it? Yeah. Did they do that? Yeah. Anything there, John, you want to interject? Just, I think as a coach, you gotta, you have to understand exactly what he's saying. I mean, you gotta understand the small wins that are not in the box score, that may may not be in the newspaper, may not be in the, you know, in the storyline, but, you know, if you win those small battles, those are going to eventually turn to become bigger ones. And, you know, in terms of coming back, not only maybe in that at bat, but maybe in the fourth at bat, that game. Mm. Or, or, you know, uh, maybe after that bad inning, you come out and throw up a couple zeros. You know, I mean, there's, there's time to redeem yourself. And, um, you know, I think that's very, very important because, you know, it could be 0 for 4 in the box score. And you know what? Those are three, you know, three of the four were really quality of bats. Or, and then you have a three for four and the guy's thinking, hey, you know, he's hitting the ball all over the yard, but really, you know, it's, it's a funny game in that regard. Mm. And you got to make sure that you really realize that, I think as a coach, um, you know, is that you're not looking at the end result a lot of times. Okay. Keep it simple and let it happen within your personality and belief systems. Yeah, I just think you have to take a look at uh, the values that you're putting in place as a, as a coach uh, for your young men, women. Um, 
those, those core kind of values, and you need to do it your way. You know, I mean, the, 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 the book is a, a, a great uh, resource. It's a heck of a resource. Now, take that stuff that you connect with out of that book and put it into your personality and put it forth. Mm, mm. And try to keep it as simple as possible, <laughs> which is difficult sometimes. Yeah. But simple is better. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, mean, I can't be Coach Gillespie or Coach Snow or, you know, somebody that I've, I've learned a lot from. Uh, I've got to take a lot of those things, but I've got to be myself. And, and that's, the, I think, the best message to your team is when you are being yourself and when you're, and then, and then if you catch yourself trying to be somebody else, the, the game, it, the game will treat you, you know, rough. Mm. And it's, it's so important that, uh, you know, you not only get to know yourself as a coach and then, you know, like I said, I, it'll implement into the players and then and ultimately we want them to compete and to get to know themselves as well as they can. All right. Great. Thanks guys. Hello, I'm Ken Revisa. Good to be with you today. And um, I have a good friend of mine, coach, ex-student, ex-coach, unbelievable, Steve Browsey with us today. And uh, our background goes back to Cal State Fullerton, where I had Steve as a student and as a player. And then also Steve went from there for his into his professional career and then ended up being the head coach at Cal State Northridge where I came up and worked with his teams on a regular basis over the years and it was a blast and then Steve went from there to Fresno State where he was the pitching coach up there and now Steve's just returned back to Cal State Fullerton made the full circle where he's the pitching coach but one thing with Steve is he's always been into the mental game and um, Steve, if you could just talk about the mental game and how it's impacted you as a coach. Well, it's, it's everything to me as a coach uh, because I've come to the understanding that without the mental game, there is no physical game, at least not a quality one. And so I'm also a, a guy who's always looking to find an edge for my players. And it's very difficult to do that in today's world um, because of information availability, because of the information and availability of uh, progressive strength training, technique training, etc. So if the whole world knows about all of these things, how do you get ahead? How do you gain an edge on the competition? Right. And you were way back in the day, 15 years ago in Northridge, you were, you were into it. Definitely. Very much so, and uh, you know the the interesting thing about the uh, the mental game for me, anyways, is I've had a variety of experiences, including I would also add to that I was at Long Beach State for That's years. That's true. Which I forgot. We, right. We put the mental game to some pretty good use there. Yes. In '93, four and five. Yes. A um, couple of great stories out of that. Uh, you can write a book on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just right. like that one '93 year alone. Yeah. Um, and then I coached at LA City College too, which is a whole different environment. And, uh, and I used to come up to your city college yeah, too. Yes, it's yes, strong. yes. And you know, boy, did you talk about people that needed the mental game. Uh, those kids needed the mental game of life just to get, just to get to the field every day. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, they they say uh, invention is the mother of necessity, but um, or did I get that wrong? Is it necessity is the invention of no? It's it's invention is yeah. the mother of necessity. There you go. And so I think I've. I've felt the need over the years to um, a survive by utilizing the mental game and b then prosper. All right, good, good. Talk to me, Steve, about how you've used heads up baseball one and and then in heads up baseball two. How you see that? Because I know when we were writing the book. You were so helpful because we had reached a point where we needed some feedback and we sent it out to you. And you wrote back about five pages of notes. If you could just talk about how you see Heads Up Baseball 1 and, and the evolution to Heads Up Baseball 2. Well, the biggest thing is the word competition. Um, but beyond that, I'd like to lay a little bit of a foundation. As an assistant coach, 
regardless of where you're at, Fullerton, Fresno State, Long Beach State, et cetera, you're, you're somewhat beholden to the ideals of the program that the head guy sets out. And that's, that's fine. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Um, but uh, you don't necessarily have free reign to use what you want to use with the mental game or other facets of the game um, completely. And so you have to structure the mental game hmm. to, to fit the program itself because the program is always the most important. Right. Um, so I've, you know, I, I, I vacillated through a few things um, as in my time as an assistant trying to figure that out, how to get the most out of the mental game in this particular program on this particular year with these particular group of players. Hmm. Um, in this particular conferences, conferences were changing a lot in recent years, and so that you know threw a wrinkle at it. Um, and so, the word competition is the biggest difference in Heads of Baseball 2.0 versus the original book, in my opinion. Um, and I've often struggled a little bit, to be honest. Um, figuring out how to take the mental tools, which I believed in, and make them practical from a competitive standpoint. How do you get to that point where these tools are putting you in a place to compete in, in your own best way, in the best version of yourself? And 2.0 has, has, has offered that. Um, and I know it's years and years of conversation and experience with guys like Joe Madden and Marcel Latchman and everybody else that you've worked with, um, John Savage, college guys, pro guys, and, and so forth. But it's, it's for me, it's like, bingo, there it is. All this stuff I believed in now leads to, is, is now a roadmap to gaining a competitive edge, teaching players, helping players teach themselves to become better competitors. And in the end, sports is about competition. Hmm. And so uh, I, I'm just, uh, I'm how super did, excited about how it. How did it provide a roadmap for you, Steve? Well, the roadmap is, it's a system. Okay, so, you know, starting with the foundation of responsibility, you can lay it out to your players. I, I use it myself as well. Um, and I actually talk to a few friends here and there. Uh, some of them think I'm cuckoo, but some of them <laughs> get it too, you know. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, the, it, it lays out the, the foundation of responsibility. Um, I love the theme also. Let me sidetrack here a little bit. Um, I love the theme that keeps popping up in 2.0 on knowing thyself, um, self-awareness, because that principle dates back to Plato on through Coleridge and up until yep. now into 2.0. And that is elemental, in my opinion, is knowing yourself as a foundation and taking on the responsibility of, uh, of, of the ingredients that go into performing. And then, so then you've got this, uh, here's the way I look at it, Ken. What you can establish the foundation for improved competitive performance by taking on the responsibility, being accountable for your actions, which is standard across the board in our world if you're going to, if you're shooting for excellence. Right. But then from there, it's like, here's a buffet of tools. I go to a buffet. Even though I want to eat everything, I can't eat everything. So I pick this one's best and that one's best. And I might taste this one and go, nope, not eating it, and move on to the next one. Well, 2.0, and, and well, the first book did as well, offers us as competitors a buffet of tools to use to gain advantage over competition. Now it's up to the guy to figure out which, which items from the buffet he chooses to use, mm. and some experimentation is going to be necessary, which ones work for him. And what works for you is definitely not going to work for me. And each, This allows each, each ball player, each coach, each whomever who's trying to excel to be themselves mm. and be their own unique youth organism. And to me, that's the fun in it. It's, it's systematic, but it allows for the freedom to explore within the within the entity of each unique organism, what we know as our players. Great. All right. Not bad. Let me just let me just add one more thing. Yep. I'll add one more thing. Add whatever you want. Okay. Okay. One of the reasons the mental game 
and being a disciple of, of, your, of your ideals, psychological ideals, is so important to me. Is Let's be real clear though, Steve, when you say disciple, collaborator. We've shared so okay. much over the years, bouncing ideas off of each other. I think I've learned as much from you as you've learned from me. Let's be real clear. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I appreciate that. Okay, collaborator. But all we hear this all the time, and we understand it as, as a truth. The game is 80% mental and 20% physical, or 90-10. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard 70-30. 80 is like the lowest I've ever heard. From uh, great minds saying this, successful people. And then we go spend all our practice time on the physical, the 20%. And, but we expect our players to be, we hold them accountable for being mentally tough, but we're not practicing it. Hmm. And to me, that, that, that's been an issue. Um, I, I see that in a, in a variety of different ways. I'll give you an example of a, a technical thing. I hear pitching coaches say so often, use your legs when you pitch. But they're not, the pitcher's not told how to do it. Well, this is the how. The game's 80% mental. It's a, it's, it's, you, that phrase is used so often, it's cliche. Mm. But what is the meaning behind it? And specifically, how? How do I train myself for that 80%. Well, it's right there in 2.0, and you can take that buffet that's in 2.0 and the principles that are in it and put it to use and know that when you tell your players, hey, this game's 80% mental, I'm actually coaching you on that 80% as well. And I think the other side of that, Steve, is trying to take that 80% mental and take the mental game and integrate it into task relevant performance cues that you're already using in the physical performance. So then now what we do is we bring awareness, we bring focus into those skills. So those skills are used to enhance and that's where the collaboration comes that the physical gets intertwined with the mental and they go together. Let's go back to the original book and a lot of conversations uh, during the writing of that book and the interim period between book one and 2.0. Um, you must control the self to control the body, to control the pitch or the bat. That still reigns true. And so we're going to go, are we going to go work on controlling the bat or the pitch? without first controlling the self, mm. when we know it's 80%. <laughs> right. We're saying it, we're yeah. running around saying it, yeah. it's 80% the self part, and, but we skip it. Yeah. Hey, work on your swing. Not that there's anything wrong with being technically correct with your pitching delivery or your mechanics or your fielding mechanic, hitting mechanics, what have you. Um, certainly that's important, but we're really not gonna get as much out of that those practices those opportunities to develop, let's call it good muscle memory, mm, okay? Mm. Unless we tend to the mental part of it first. Right. And so, yeah. yeah, control the mind. One last thing, Steve, in terms of, you've really used a book with your team almost like a class, yes. where the guys were in a classroom situation going over it, and then you'd go out to the field and have your bullpens and other things. Could you talk about that a little bit, the class part of it? Yeah, well, <laughs> dealing with millennials is a little different uh, when it comes to asking them to pay attention. But one thing I go back to over and over and over, and what I learned from you in all of our interaction is you got about 15 seconds to, to grab their attention, and then they need a little break, and then you go another 15 seconds and so forth. So I really try to, you know, that's a lot of 15 seconds uh, stacked on top of one, one another. But um, here, here's the bottom line. Uh, for me, for me, it's one thing to coach people, teach people sound principles, but it's a whole nother thing if they understand why first. And to me, there's power. And so it, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, half a century ago in this country, when the authoritative figure said, do it, you just did it. You might not have wanted to do it, but you knew the consequences were worse than just doing it. 
Right. And you could make progress that way. I don't believe that the world works that way anymore. It's it's changed. It's I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not being the old guy who's saying no kids today or anything like that. It's it's it is what it is. It's cultural. And these kids have a lot of information at their fingertips. I mean, you know, a universe full of mm, information. Mm, mm. And so if you don't give them the why before you ask them to do it, I think you're, the probability of success is very low. So get into the classroom. Here's why we're doing this, okay? Here's how. Give them that roadmap we, sp yep. we spoke about. Try to keep it real simple. And then take it out to the field so that there's some inspiration maybe in that, in that man's heart or soul mm. <laughs> to put full effort into this and, and go at the very least it get get sincere experimentation. Well, let me give give this a real shot to see if it works. At the very least, yep. maybe you can get a little more of that with the classroom situation. But um, you know, it, it, it's it's just like a, it's no different than than a student taking uh, a psychology class. You got to take the notes. You got to hear the lecture yep. before you take the test. Yeah, yeah, and you do the preparation. And yeah, take it. Get, get the information. Do the preparation. Then take the test. That's baseball. Get the information, do the practice, and then take the test. That's game day. <laughs> you got it. All right. Thanks, Steve. Fantastic, man. Thanks, Ken. Ken Ravizzi here. Great to be with you. And today, John Savage is sitting beside me, and I've had the privilege of working with John up at UCLA. I think we started in 2010, John. Yep. And we're going into year eight. Here we go, man. Yep. Excited <laughs> about it. And John has coached in the past up at um, University of Nevada, Reno, up at, uh, then came down to SoCal, then at UC Irvine, and then at UCLA in 2013, won the national championship. And this summer, coached Team USA. And congrats on that as Thank well, you. John. Good show, man. Thank you. All right. Hey, John, could you talk a little bit about the mental game? And how it's evolved for you? Well, I think when you, you came in with us, I think it just it set a whole different sort of platform for our coaches, really, uh, in terms of handling players uh, on day-to-day -day basis, in terms of developing something to go to, uh, in terms of pitchers, in terms of position players, in terms of hitters, in terms of defense. Uh, there was all sort of different techniques and uh, ways to become a better in-game player. Hmm. And uh, that was really what we're trying to get to is handling, handling this game of, 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 of failure, handling this, the bumps in, uh, along the, uh, of a game, both offensively and defensively. And it, it just has really given our, our coaches slash players really uh, something to go to and have characteristics on how to deal with with the game on both sides of the ball. So when you're saying coaches and players, what do you mean coaches? I think it just slows the game down for coaches. You know, we have to make in-game decisions as well as players, both offensively or pitch calling, and you have your breath or you have a, a you know, a light to go to uh, or a focal point, something that you can you can go to that will slow you down and make you have a clearer mind, mm. make you think a little clearer and foresee, uh, you know, what's coming around, what's what's being done presently during the game, and maybe what's on deck or what's in the hole or, uh, you know, what, what's coming around the next inning. It, it just gives you a little more awareness and, and freedom to think clearly from pitch to pitch. And I think as you're saying that, John, this is a key point, that as a coach, you're working on your mental game and your staff's working on it because they get it. And the beautiful thing about you working on your mental game with coaching is that helps you in working with the athletes you're yeah. working with on their mental game because you're not just talking about some abstract thing, but you're talking about something where we're all working on. Yeah, and players are going to respond a lot of times how their leaders or coaches are responding. I mean, they're going to they're going to feel more confident if they know that their coach is under control. Right. If he's controlling the, the variables, you know, 
uh, where if there's panic and there's confusion or there's madness, then a lot of times the game will be cluttered and the player will act the same way as their coach. Yes. And so I think it really trickles down into that calmness or that confidence levels to where that whole program regarding of you, you bring somebody off the bench or you bring somebody out of the bullpen and they have those same sort of characteristics that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you use it with the players, John. Well, I think it's so important that, you know, the language that we learn from uh, the book and just through conversation that it's, it's consistency, you know, you, you need to be very consistent in your message in meetings, uh, in the weight room, in practice, in drills, in the hitting facility, in the bullpen and long toss and flat ground that you're sending consistent messages and verbiage that they can relate to. Right. And I, you know, so I think it's very important that you are sending messages on a, on a daily, uh, you know, because it's such a, it's such a routine game uh, that you need to set the routines and, and, and set, um, you know, characteristics of, of, of verbals and uh, bullet points really to how they're going to respond. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's what we try to do is we try to educate our players as much as possible in terms of getting to know uh, our, our mental approach and also ultimately getting to know themselves. Ah, interesting. Yeah. And getting to know themselves in what way, John? Just they need to know their levels of uh, how high uh, do they, they want to get when they compete. Right. Uh, you know, uh, does, does outside things get them outside of their comfort level, mm. uh, their A game, their B game, their C game. Uh, you know, all those things, they have to go about it a certain way uh, every day. Yeah. And uh, regardless of how they feel, and uh, regardless of what's going on, losing streak, winning streak, 0 for 15, uh, three or four bad outings, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's really that the game will teach you, uh, you know, uh, that you must have something to go to. And that's what we're trying to install in our players. Right. And the something to go to being, yes, all the physical skills and the repetitions and the work we do, but then also the mental skills. No question. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a mental game that they, they, they must learn, and that's what the, the, book, the second book, I think, ties in that competitive, competitiveness level to where now, uh, you know, it, there, there is confrontation in this game. Mm. And, and, and there is, uh, you know, it is a me first you proposition a lot of times. So it's not about who it is. It's just about, you know, there's going to be an opponent yep. and you must be able to, uh, you know, compete uh, and execute and, and, and get to the next pitch uh, more often than not. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Talk to me about heads up baseball too, John, and how, how you saw that, how you use that. You mentioned the competitive part. Uh, I, think, I think that's really the, 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 the new piece uh, that, that's really being presented to players mm. in this book. Mm. Uh, that uh, we are, as a coach, you're always looking for that competitor. But, and in relation to that, John, it goes back because the competitive piece really came from conversation we had yeah. when we were talking about players in the past. Yeah. Remember one day you and the staff were frustrated mm -hmm. with just they don't compete. Yeah. They don't know what it means to compete. Yeah. And you know, it's like and then you explain the travel ball, the way they yeah. it's different today yeah. than twenty years ago, yeah. fifteen years ago when you were coaching, you yeah. didn't have to teach how to compete. No. Nope. For whatever reason, the, the accountability has been taken off them. Uh, the responsibility piece has been taken off them. And now it's our job is really to put it back onto them mm. and, and, and put it on their, uh, their plate to make sure that they are prepared, that they're ready uh, physically and mentally and mechanically and all those aspects. But 
Um, it's, uh, it's an ongoing um, development, really, mm -hmm. that you must install. It's, it's like system quarterbacks. You know, they must, it's corporate knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Greg Popovich uh, talks about corporate knowledge in terms of, uh, you know, what is a spur? What, what is, what is, does that guy know himself? Does he know the league? Does he know his role? You know, those are all factors that make a team. Right. And you got to be a part of a team. You got to have a role that fits on part of a team. And if you can find that role and find that niche, I think, I think it, it, it's going to help the mental state of that team. Right. And, and that's what we're all trying to get to is a competitive team that has, at times, it needs a short memory, mm. and at other times, it needs a little longer memory. It, 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 it's all about timing, and, and this game yeah. is about timing, and uh, it's about leverage, you know? Hitting is leverage, hitting is timing, pitching is leverage and, and timing, and, and those are all factors that uh, the mental side of it is so important that you have a, a, a good grasp and a clear vision on, um, you know, I'm being external and I am competing um, and I'm still having, like I said, something to go to and I have a strong mental foundation. And when you say external, talk about that, John, because we talk about that a lot. Yeah, I think it's just, it's something where they're really getting into the game. They're really getting into the pitch to pitch. They're really getting into competing. They're not worried about mechanics. They're not worried about the, the umpire. They're, they're not, you know, they're not building up crutches of excuse uh, of, of, you know, of, of why they didn't do so well. They, they need to get out there. They need to really, uh, you know, um, you know, throw them through the glove as a pitcher and, 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 you know, putting a good swing on the ball. You don't have control of things that go on after that, but right. at the same time, you know, you can't get too internal. You can get too, um, you know, uh, you could become very quiet. You could become very uh, sheltered. You could become very almost mute to where, you know, you lose your persona, you lose your presence. You, I mean, mm, you know, mm. are you a fiery competitor or are you, uh, you know, a quiet, you know, presence competitor? I mean, there's different levels. It, it, it's, and it you've had a lot of pitches. I've had a lot of different and a lot of different, different emotions. That. Right, exactly. And you got to find what allows them, you know, what is their comfort level of competitiveness, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that's really, uh, you know, getting to know your athlete um, as well as you can and, and seeing, um, you know, what is their successes, what is their failures, and what goes on during those times to dictate, you know, what, 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 how, to, how, to, how to communicate with them. Right. Uh, and, and good coaching is also uh, when you communicate. You know, there's timing to things. Mm, uh, mm. You know, maybe some things are better not, you know, not said in front of a team. Some things are sometimes not better off said that day. Maybe I should hit it the next day. And I think as a coach, I think timing is very important. And one of the things there, John, in working with you for the past eight years yeah. that I see is your debriefings after a ball game are very, very powerful in terms of getting the knowledge from yeah. the results. You know, you got your result. Maybe we won, maybe we lost. How do we get better? And your ability in those, that situation to express that to the players, yeah. it's, I think, one of your real strengths. Well, thank you. I mean, I think it's very important that we show them examples of good or bad throughout the game that, you know, that we try not to make those mistakes over and over and over again, you know? Right. Right. And, um, it, it's important that you bring up uh, those factors, I think, right away uh, after a game because they tend to forget quickly, mm. uh, this, this, this athlete does. And sometimes that's a really good characteristic, and other times you're like, they keep on stepping in the same hole. So, right. you know, it, it's, it's a fine line, but I, I do like to debrief, um, you know, prepare, play, and then debrief, you know, right. as quickly as we can. And, you know, in a college season, you can do that. Uh, you know, we played, I think, it's almost 70 games in our national championship season. Most of the time you're playing 56 to 65 or something. So, you know, it makes it a little tougher, I think, obviously, when you're playing 
162. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. So a little, like, little we different. We understand that question. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. Thanks, John. Good. Good teams. Thanks, John. Routine is just a consistent uh, approach uh, that is uh, in, in, in practices. You got you, you got to practice your routine uh, in in uh, of uh, days that you don't play that carry into uh, your bat, into your circle on defense, into approaching the rubber, uh, just having a, a, a pregame. Uh, it's just very consistently on your approach that will be a day-to-day -day same. The routine is not routine. It always has meaning. If it ever loses its meaning, it won't work for you. But if you can keep the meaning to the routine, then it has impact. And it's the process <clears throat> you use uh, to play the game and prepare to play the game. For me, the routine uh, has multiple meanings, not the least of which, uh, when I played for Coach Snow at Cal State Fullerton, he often mentioned we're creatures of habit. And so doing things within the context of a routine, especially a good one, <laughs> is the part of the process of developing good habits. And then from a competition standpoint, if your routine is solid and you've developed faith in it and trust, then you have something to go to during competition. And as far as having an edge over the competition, uh, to me that's huge because it's my belief that the guy I'm competing against, either he has something to go to and I need to have something to go to to keep pace with him, or if he doesn't, then I'm one step ahead of him.